I have guitarist Anthony Garcia and didgeridoo player William Barton with me. What would you like to play? Yeah, so it's called Malili Dreaming and uh, it's, uh, it's another track from the Desert Stars Dancing CD and uh, yeah, with pleasure. Can you give me your ear?
Beautiful stuff. The sounds of Anthony Garcia on the guitar and William Barton on the didgeridoo. And a little piece from their most recent project together, Desert Stars Dancing, a journey with didgeridoo and guitar. And that piece called Malili Dreaming. Uh, it's sort of fitting to have you back in an ABC studio, really, isn't it? Because that's where you first met. It is. Yeah, up in Townsville. In Townsville. <laughs> Would have been uh, 2008 or 2009. I think it was nine, yeah, because mm. it was yeah the year that we had the Darwin Festival as well. So we did a few shows that, that year. And we played, was it Malili Dreaming? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Improvised for the first time. Yeah. Now, the, the two of you come from, in some ways, different backgrounds, um, but you are in many ways kindred spirits, aren't you? You both have a, a real thirst for experimenting with with what you've done with both the didgeridoo and the guitar well certainly you know the exploration of uh extended technique and how many i guess uh worlds you can create just from one note on the guitar and on the didgeridoo and and having all these different uh layers and i guess a whole landscape a repertoire of landscape um settings you know Mm. and um it's kind of like just we you know essentially breathe together when we're performing and um that's an important thing to communicate, you know, when you're working with your fellow musicians to, to be on that same sort of brain wave, you know, brain, 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 brain world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What is interesting is, uh, and especially for you, I guess, William, is an instrument like the didgeridoo, which you have very successfully placed in uh, very classically refined settings. You've played with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra and all sorts of uh, highly renowned stages with an instrument that I would have thought from the outset would have been difficult to have that level of control, to be able to maintain the pitch and the tone. But you've adapted it, haven't you? You you even adapted it just today for today's performance. (laughs) Yes, right. (laughs) With a bit of toilet paper. With a toilet paper roll and (laughs) gaff tape, you know, to to get it in tune, depending on what mood it's in. I will certainly like, uh, you know, from way back from when I was growing up in Mount Isa, it was, uh, I guess, something that... I sort of really got drawn to it was the classical music um, as well as my ACDC, my Led Zeppelin and so on. But my mother used to play, you know, classical to me, uh, music to me before I was born. Um, she was a great fan of Mario Lund and the great Caruso. So uh, greatly as with many musicians, you know, in our position here, um, you know, we've got a diversity of, um, you know, music coming uh, growing up, you know, and uh, certainly I wanted to, to almost prove uh, um, that the didgeridoo wasn't just a droning instrument but it was more you know it can be integrated with any style of music and the extended technique uh, aspects of the instrument to go far beyond um, you know normal reason. Mm. Mm. And for you Anthony you also have uh, traversed the musical spectrum with your instrument Mm. because you've uh, studied classical guitar but you've also Mm. been interested in uh, improvisation and uh, and and jazz. Give us just a little bit of background about mm. some of those journeys for you and and some of the highlights. Yeah, look, I I think what one one of the wonderful things about classical music is that there is probably no genre that extends instrumental playing into as diverse a range of possibilities as classical music. Or we often think of it as a quite a rigid sort of approach to music making. But uh, when you look at all the different types of composers, a Debussy or, a, you know, a, um, J.S. Bach, uh, all through to the modern composers or 
or John Cage, you see uh, musicians, instrumentalists really exploring the possibilities of their instrument and the way that might represent their experiences. Now, if you add to that, I guess, a jazz mindset, which is where, yes, you can do that, but you actually do it in the moment, not, not all prepared, but allow some space for something to happen in that moment. Um, when you bring them together, your life in your music making um, tends to unfold uh, I guess in, in a way that um, connects you to your experiences. And so when you play with different musicians or you visit different places, you're able to absorb the experience and reflect that in your music making. And it's, it's really interesting. I was just um, editing a piece, a piece I composed many years ago, and I, and I looked at my old score. And before I met Will, I actually had this little section that said, try and imitate the didge <laughs> on the guitar, you know. And so it's obviously, you know, a sound. If you live in Australia, and I've, it's probably come about because I saw Will play at some festival and didn't even know and just absorbed it and then mm -hmm. started um, writing this piece and thought, I want a drone in there, try and imitate the didge. And How so did it go? Look, it, I mean, it's it's something that, look, it's never going it to, it's meant to be imitative in a way. So it's successful in the sense that it's not trying to copy it or be it. But it's like saying, oh, I heard that. I love that sound. I'm, I'm going to try and reflect something of the dronal pulsation that the dig has in that composition. So that's come out in later pieces. And then since we've played together, it was almost like I'd been preparing myself um, for a future of playing with the dig because it's, it's an instrument, I guess, like, you know, Will has said, it's, it's way beyond just a dronal instrument. Mm. Um, and it, it's a, it's a color. It's like a painting. It's like a good instrument, and a good instrumentalist is like a painter of sound. And and uh, from what you'll hear with with what Will does, it's it's exactly that. And well, let's take a little listen to you yeah. in action. The most recent project uh, that you've been working on together has resulted in an album, Desert Stars Dancing. Yes. Uh, and I take it we're going to at least visit some of this. So, it, like you said, you, you're coming from a, a jazz background as well. So so we're not mm. talking about a. Mm. a uh, a, a fully notated piece of music here, are we? Look, we when we say jazz, we it's in the broadest Australian sense. Good jazz. Uh, so jazz. that incorporates a bit of you know a bit of folk and a bit of a lot of things. I mean, it's it's a hard word to pin down. It's not the Dixieland sort of it's thing. Jazzalia. Jazzalia, yeah, <laughs> jazz aliens. Um, it, there is scores uh, to this particular piece we're going to present. Yeah, there is a score, but it's. You know, once we sit down and play, that's sort of the end of the score. It really, we can't stay to that. <laughs> okay. Well, what would you like to play for us? Uh, we're going to play uh, an excerpt from uh, um, Sunrise and Flight. So we're going to kind of combine these two separate little pieces into one. Um, it's reflective of the outback. I've spent some time in Arnhem Land and, um, you know, Will's been all over the, the country absorbing um, you know, the landscape in his music making. So it's, it's sort of a fusion of that experience, that aesthetic from the outback.
Hopefully you could uh, sense the warm glow of the sun coming over the horizon and the, the twinkle of the wings of uh, the birds in flight. The beautiful sounds of uh, didgeridoo player William Barton and guitarist Anthony Garcia and a gorgeous piece of music from uh, a recent project of theirs, Desert Stars Dancing, A Journey with Didgeridoo and Guitar and uh, a little of two pieces put together there, Sunrise and Flight. William... Uh, you spoke before about this um, this quest, if you like, to try and expand the capabilities of what the didgeridoo can do and to, to push what its limits can be musically and how it's received musically. I'm wondering for you, for you what has been the most challenging part of that journey for you? Were there, were there stumbling blocks or were there, were there points where you felt it couldn't go any broader or, or further? Well, um, you know, in a sense, the sky is limited and beyond. Um, I guess, you know, travelling back to the journey of when I first played with the Symphony Orchestra was when I was 17. You know, people, I guess, really um, at that particular gig um, really got it, you know. And but then to get further beyond that, you had to like I guess prove to um, um, you know, management management of you know orchestras and so on to prove that it was a an instrument that was fit for you know this um, such a sophisticated world. Yet you know, uh, the did you do itself you know is can be very basic, but it can co- also be a complicated and uh, sophisticated world in itself. Uh, especially, you know, coming from the landscape and being used in ceremonial use, you know, for thousands of years. Um, there's different languages of the didgeridoo. It's like a speaking language. So when one becomes familiar with the instrument, uh, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, you know, you can actually sort of tell, oh, okay, that didgeridoo player must have learned from that area or was taught by that teacher because of the way the technique is, um, you know, articulated. And even the sound of the didgeridoo. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, being in this modern day and age, we absorb our environment. And so that's, you know, the that's what makes the, the world a lot smaller and, you know, to, to be able to adapt to... Um, you know, beatboxing and so on, you know, <laughs> overseas, like I guess one of my first sort of hip hop or breakbeat sort of songs was, you know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five sort of thing, you know. The and message. Yeah, the message, you know. And so a uh, bit of Beat Street action. <laughs> um, but, you know, certainly um, with the Did You Do, you know, I just wanted it to be there in as one with a united 
you know, front in, in a classical world because mm. you're, you're playing to... But it must have, like you said, it must have required you, for you to have been very courageous to have proven that this is an instrument that you can you can control so finely that it's able to, to stand up on stage next to these instruments that uh, have been part of the classical canon for, for centuries. Yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, you know, their uh, violin might cost a million dollars, mine costs uh, a termite, you know. <laughs> the termites hollow it out. So, I mean, it was just, it, it was not, wasn't taking the, the mickey out of it at all. It was, it was about just being there and being able to communicate with the conductor, with the composer, you know, having worked with Skullthorpe and um, Ross Edwards and Matthew Heinsohn and Lisa, Lisa Lim and those guys, you know, and girls, um, just to, to take it to the world. And I always acknowledge that, you know, there was components in the past, set in the 70s, even earlier, where um, classical composers combined the did you do with uh, their pieces but I wanted to take it beyond to what I felt was um, beyond the tokenistic level where it was music was music and there was two very uh, similar and dissimilar cultures that were going to be, you know, as strong as one. Anthony, can I ask you too, when it comes to trying to represent the Australian landscape in, in sound and a lot of people yeah. have... Uh, have tried to do that in lots of different ways. Mm. You know, the good old lager phone has done a good job of it <laughs> in the past too. Um, but but for you, coming from a more international background, you, mm. you you know you've studied experimental guitar in New York and you've you've played in many parts of the world. Uh, what was your your impression of or or your experience of of trying to to capture that sense? Mm. Was it a difficult one for you? No, um, it, it's. It's it's not difficult um, because you don't really write a piece of music unless you kind of you know feel you're moved in some way, uh, either visually or you know psychologically. In some way, you're moved to 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 compose a piece and start getting some notes down and experiment um, with a certain sound. So it doesn't uh, it's it's not that hard because it's sort of it's like this is the time i've had this experience or sometimes i even anticipate the experience where i think i'm going to go there and you start thinking about what it would be like and stuff comes out and then you get there and you go oh wow it's like i'm almost sort of transported um to this place before i got there so i th i think it's it's not hard it, it just it um I think that's the the beauty of allowing yourself just to write what you write when when it feels right, and you know in that way I think you can represent um, many aspects of life, landscape, and 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 experience. Um, just how an audience interprets that, and 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 in what way they are, you know, perhaps moved in the same way you are. That's that's a different thing, and that's that's hard for me to say. But you know, after. You know, people come and speak to us after concerts and often say, yep, I was transported. You know, maybe because the music transports them and maybe we also say, by the way, this is inspired by this and then they go. So it's a combination, I think, of imagination and something, you know, like if you reflect insect sounds or uh, or you have a certain sort of harmonic sound that kind of has an openness to it, you can kind of allude to the landscape then you're sort of expecting or hoping that the audience has to take their imagination to the party as well for it to be a full picture. Uh, Anthony, William, thanks ever so much. Thanks, mate. Cheers. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the Inside Sleeve with Robbie Buck on RN.